Back in the early 1990s, my uncle worked on board a commercial fishing vessel out of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. It was a 95-foot trawler operated by a seven-man crew and would take regular runs anywhere between a few days to a week out at sea. It was a dangerous job. The North Atlantic was a cold, cruel place. When you were a hundred miles from the shore, in the middle of a storm, with waves battering the rusted hull of your boat, your only protection from the fury of the sea, you really feel true isolation and terror. For those who aren't familiar, trawling is a fishing method which involves casting a net into the ocean and dragging it steadily through the water, picking up anything that gets caught. The net would then be pulled out of the water and the crew would sort out which fish to take to market and which to throw back. Bycatch was very common. Oftentimes, other animals would inadvertently get caught in the net, such as dolphins, seabirds, small sharks, seals, and sea turtles. Those would be released back into the sea, but not without almost certainly being injured or killed by the net. It pained my uncle to see these creatures like this, but he was young and had to put food on the table for his new family. However, the ocean does not make it easy to do this kind of work. Commercial fishing was a risky endeavor. It wasn't common for entire crews to die out there. That was a possibility that weighed on my uncle's mind every time a storm was brewing while he was at sea. One such trip finally made him quit, and to this day, the memory of his former friend and crew member still haunts him. It was supposed to be a short three-day trip to Bottom Troll for Halibut. Being the dead of winter, the crew did not want to be exposed to the unpredictable weather for too long. The quote often goes, If you don't like the weather in insert place, just wait five minutes and it will change. Everyone says this about their region, but this quote was first penned by Mark Twain specifically about New England. The trip started on a brisk but sunny morning, but as the day went on, dark storm clouds gathered and stayed in the region for the entire duration. Out there, scattered showers pelted the crew and towering waves rammed and tossed their boat. The cold and the wet chilled their fingers to the bone, making a difficult job even harder. Then they began to notice barnacles spreading across the hull, starting at the bow. They were few at first, staying well below the waterline, but as the day progressed, more and more appeared, growing unusually fast. Their captain, Mateo, was puzzled, but the crew had recently removed all of the barnacles before heading out. How could they return so quickly? But since that was an issue that was much lower on their list of priorities, they chose to ignore it for the time being. That first night, while my uncle was enjoying his four hours of sleep, he had an unusual dream, one where he was standing at the bottom of the ocean, looking up at the surface far above him. Though he was underwater, he was breathing perfectly fine. The light above was a pale pink-purple hue, shifting and pulsing with the flow of the water. All around, the carcasses of fish, squid, whales, and other sea creatures rained down in slow motion, leaving trails of bubbles in their wake. Then, the sea grew darker, enveloping him in a shroud of complete blackness. With it came a long, deep rumble in the distance, which caused his entire body to vibrate. The light coming through from the surface faded, and right when the last inkling disappeared, he woke up. In the morning, he casually mentioned his unusual dream to the others, thinking nothing of it. But when they heard his story, their faces went flush and they reluctantly admitted that they too had experienced similar dreams. Though not exactly like my uncle's, they each saw their own version of it. Lancaster, the fisherman whom my uncle was closest friends with, said that in his dream, instead of standing on the ocean floor, he was hovering with hundreds, even thousands of feet of water above and below him. He couldn't even tell there was a floor to begin with. Then, as the darkness closed in around him, and the grinding, bellowing noise came, he looked down. Slowly, the ground opened up, a yellow glow emanating from the newly formed fissure. As the fissure grew wider and wider, he suddenly realized what he was looking at was an enormous eye. Despite this, Lancaster and the others, being the tough-as-nails blue-collar men that they were, did not let their demeanors falter in front of each other. They brushed the dreams off and stayed focused on the work ahead. They still had several tons of fish to catch and a fat payout to chase. Lancaster, however, was especially quiet after that. That day, they were at the mercy of the waves, which came with more aggression than before. Some were nearly ten feet tall and hammered the deck, 
soaking the men in freezing cold water. The barnacles had grown even more, and by now they were beginning to increase drag on the vessel. It was when the crew approached the continental shelf that things would take a turn for the worse. Right before the drop-off, the crew lowered the drag arms and tossed the trawl nets down, cruising at a steady three knots to drag the nets on the bottom of the ocean. All went well at first, until the starboard net had suddenly been caught. This was not usually a concern, but as hard as the crew tried, they could not pull it free. On the sonar, they saw a large indistinct shape in the water, right behind their trawl. The outline of it was hazy, they couldn't determine what exactly the shape was. At first, they thought it was a shoal of fish, but that didn't explain what was keeping their net from moving. As they watched, the shape grew larger and larger. Mateo scoffed that the transducer must have been malfunctioning. They tried to reel the net in, hoping to cut their losses before it took too much damage, but the winch wouldn't budge. Whatever was holding the net in place, it was too strong for the winch to pull. By now, the engine was straining, and the stronger they pulled, the more the boat's starboard side was pulled down, tipping it dangerously into the water. Black smoke billowed from the exhaust as the engine began to shut down. In all the chaos, my uncle looked over at Lancaster and noticed he had completely blanked out. At first, my uncle thought he was frozen in fear, but that didn't make sense, because Lancaster had more experience than him and was no stranger to high-intensity situations like this. He remembered how shocked Lancaster was in the morning, and realized something must have really gotten to him. But this was no time to ask. My uncle grabbed him and had him assist in hand-pumping diesel fuel into the engine until they could get the air out of the line. If the engine failed, they would be stranded at sea. Whatever it was that had a hold of the trawl net, it was unfathomably strong. Then, after struggling for what felt like forever, the net finally came free and the men were able to reel it in. On the sonar, the shape quickly withdrew, as if it was just an anomaly on the screen. They managed to revive the engine and sped away from the area, not wanting to stick around any longer. The drag arms brought the nets up onto the deck and the men quickly sorted through their fresh catch. Immediately, they realized among the creatures they had dragged up was an enormous oarfish an absolute monster from the deep. It looked to be about 30 feet long. Though it was dead, the body was still fresh, meaning it couldn't have died too long ago. One crew member, Isaac, wondered if that was what had caught the net, but the idea was quickly dismissed because there was simply no way an animal could have done that, and the thing detected by their sonar was much, much bigger. Still, the men were puzzled by their very unusual find. Oarfish typically lived at depths of up to a thousand meters and would only come to the surface if they were sick or dying. On rare instances, they were caught by fishermen or their carcasses would wash ashore. Another crew member, Ortega, warned that oarfish were bad omens and that they should throw it back as quickly as possible. The others, including my uncle, objected the idea and reassured Ortega that everything would be fine. They decided to keep the oarfish as a memento. After putting all of their catch on ice in the hold down below, they put the oarfish on a hook and hung the carcass with cordage from one of the drag arms. Looping their course back to shore, my uncle realized that Lancaster had been silent the entire time, and when his eyes weren't locked in a dead stare, he was constantly taking nervous glances at the oarfish. My uncle asked him what was wrong, but Lancaster didn't know, he just felt that there was something off about the carcass a looming sense of dread that he couldn't explain. We really should have thrown it back, he finally said. That night, the two were working together as the others slept. Lancaster had grown increasingly distant, barely responding to my uncle, and when he did, he merely gave quick one-word answers. Multiple times my uncle caught him leaned against the railing, staring off into the inky blackness of the ocean. In one final instance, his head stuck out so far that it looked like one bad wave could send him overboard. My uncle had to stop him. He grabbed Lancaster by his shoulders and demanded, What has gotten into you? Lancaster, unfazed by the jolt he had received, asked in a calm monotone, Do you see it? See what? My uncle replied. Lancaster's behavior made him finally admit there was something deeply wrong with his friend. 
Maybe the sea was finally getting to him? Or was it something worse? He struggled to stop his mind from tumbling down the slope of possibilities he did not want to go. Lancaster simply continued staring, his gaze as empty as the endless void below them, as if to say that his silence was the answer. My uncle felt a chill run down his spine. He let go, afraid and unsure of what to do. Sit tight, he said, shivering. The air was freezing cold as it had been the entire trip, but he did not feel it biting into him until this very moment. I'll get Mateo, okay? Lancaster didn't respond. Instead, he turned back to face the sea again. My uncle rushed below deck to wake the captain, who was a bit grumpy at first for being interrupted from what little sleep he had, but obliged to go up and help. Stepping out of the cabin, they stopped. Lancaster was gone. All that met them was the wet, limp body of the oar fish, swaying back and forth with the gentle rocking of the vessel. Its silvery scales reflected hauntingly in the pale yellow deck lights. Along its body was a massive gash, revealing its hollowed out insides completely void of internal organs, like an empty discarded husk. They woke the rest of the crew, and soon all six men were desperately searching for Lancaster. They searched the entire vessel and shined their lights into the water in case he had gone overboard. Mateo swung the boat around, frantically scanning the water for any sign of him. Taking a closer look at the oarfish, their stomachs dropped when they realized it didn't look like something or someone had cut it open and gutted the carcass. It looked like something inside had torn its way out. Not taking any more chances, the crew cut the oarfish loose and tossed it overboard to be reclaimed by the sea. Following the disappearance of Lancaster, the Coast Guard led a massive search effort to find him. Sadly, they had to admit that, judging by the conditions of the sea at that time of the year, he would have died very quickly from hypothermia shortly after entering the water. After that, scavenging marine life would have picked the body apart. Their only hope was to recover any human remains they could, any trace of him to bring back to his family. Sadly, nothing was ever found. My uncle expressed his condolences to Lancaster's family, and to this day, he deeply regrets leaving his friend all alone on that cold night. I'm a sanitization specialist for the city I live in. It's mostly just a fancy name for garbage man. I guess the city tries to give us some pride with a more formal title. To be honest, I really don't give a dish whether people call me trash pickup or garbage worker. It all means the same in the end. I ride on the back of garbage trucks all day and pick up people's trash for a living. Most of the time, it's a pretty easy job with early but long hours. I don't have family at home, not even pets, so it works out for me. It's not exactly my dream job, but it's humble work and it keeps me out of trouble. I've been doing this for 15 or so years now, and you wouldn't believe the amount of insane dish I find in people's trash. I have so many stories and most people don't believe me when I tell them, so I figured I'd share them here. There seems to be a lot of crazy things that happen on this page, which is fine with me, and ain't no different than what I deal with every day. Here are a few incidents I think you all will be interested in. Every morning at exactly 7.23am, there's a man who watches us from his window when we pick up his trash. Tom, the guy who drives the truck while I load the garbage bags pulls in at around 7.20. Just exactly as I start moving his trash bins, I see a curtain move from the window. He is always hunkered down and hidden. We can only see him from his eyes to the top of his head. While this may not seem strange to most of you, it's creepy for Tom and me. I know it's common for people to watch the garbage truck from the safety of their own homes, but this dude hides himself like he doesn't want to be caught. He watches from the time we get there until the time we leave, with bright, wide eyes following my every move. That's the one thing that sends a chill down my spine every week we pick up his trash. His eyes are always so painfully wide open and bulging like they'll pop out at any minute. He has these deep, dark circles under his eyes like he hasn't slept in months. His skin is sunken and ghostly pale. I've always been too creeped out by him watching me to go check on the guy, so I usually just let it be. Once. Tom couldn't come to work because he was down with the flu. The city couldn't find someone to cover his shift, so I had to go at it alone. That day took double the time because I had to drive and load the trash. Most days I get off work around 5pm, 
but this day, I was out until after eight. I remember it was late fall when this happened. I had just finished the last of my schedule and was driving back to City Hall to pick up my car when there was something standing in the middle of the road. Now, the way our trash pickup schedule works is we start in town and make our way out into the deep country towards the end of the day. I know it really doesn't make sense, but Tom has been driving the truck long before I started working with the city, so I just follow along with what he wants. So, I was just following the usual schedule for that day, albeit it was later. It was almost completely dark outside, thanks to daylight savings time ending unfortunately, and here I was, in the middle of nowhere, in a shitty old garbage truck with someone standing in the road. Except, it wasn't really a someone, more like a thing. I slammed on my brakes to avoid hitting it before I was able to get a good look. The thing was tall. I'm talking seven feet or taller. It was completely stark white and naked. No clothes, nothing. It didn't really have a face either, just a vertical slash through the center of where its face should have been. Its arms were so long it dragged its fingers on the blacktop. I was so in shock that it took me a solid moment to notice the red liquid seeping from the bottoms of its feet. Was it blood? Or something else? All I know is, I didn't stick around long enough to find out. I swerved to the right and slammed my foot on the gas pedal and got the hell out of Dodge. Whatever that thing was, I wasn't going to take my chances. As I flew out of there, driving at at least 80 on the back roads, I heard this ear-piercing screech from behind me. It didn't sound like anything that would come from an animal, so I figured it came from the creature I saw. It sounded like it was in pain. The next day, I told Tom all about it and saw the realization flash in his eyes. One second, he was frozen with fear, and the next he acted like I was crazy. Said I was just seeing things. I didn't press the issue seeing his reaction, and we went on about our day. This story might be a bit more on the tame side. It's definitely still creepy, but less so than the other stories I have. One time, Tom let me drive our regular route for practice in case he missed a day or something. This was when I started working in the city, so I was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to learn. Tom rode on the back of the truck, and as we made a stop, he would load the trash. Except one time, we ran into a problem. There's an old woman named Mrs. Cleary who we pick up trash for in the middle of our route. She usually just has one bag, but this time she didn't have any. The first time we saw this, we just figured she didn't have any trash for the week and went on with our schedule. The next week, there still wasn't any trash. At this point, Tom and I were getting pretty worried. We went on ahead to our next house, but I called Mrs. Cleary when we stopped. She answered, but something seemed off. I let her know that there hadn't been any trash pickup at her house for two straight weeks and that we were worried something might be wrong. Right off the bat, she seemed super confused. She told me she was setting out her trash like normal and someone was coming to get it because it was gone only a few minutes after she set it outside on the curb. I thought this was strange, so Tom and I took a detour back to Mrs. Cleary's house. When we knocked on her door, she let us in and offered us a drink and some cookies like any grandmother would. We declined her offer because we couldn't stay long and explained to her that we weren't the ones who were collecting her trash. Luckily, Mrs. Cleary had her son set up a ring doorbell a few weeks ago because she noticed her hydrangeas were being destroyed by rodents and she wanted to catch them. She hadn't looked at the footage since her son installed the cameras, but when we all huddled together on the couch, we saw exactly what was happening. As soon as Mrs. Cleary shut her front door from taking out the trash, someone would crawl out of the utility building she had outside. It was a small man. He had wild hair and tattered clothes. He was skinny and short and he twitched when he walked. He made it to the curb where the trash bag was and hauled it over his shoulder. On wobbly legs, he waddled back to the utility building with the trash in tow and shut the door behind him. There was definitely a squatter living in Mrs. Cleary's building. I called the police while Tom consoled Mrs. Cleary. They arrived shortly after and arrested the man. Turns out he was just some homeless dude who was sleeping in her building and eating scraps from her trash. The police also found hydrangeas laying around a makeshift bed the squatter had put together. Mrs. Cleary always kept a lock on her building after that. I'll leave you with one last story, but I do have plenty more. When Tom and I were finished with our shift one time, and we were dumping our truck in the landfill, a thick black sludge fell out on top of the pile. At first, 
We thought it was just buildup of the gunk and grime that accumulates in the back of the truck. But the more we looked at it, the more we realized the blob was moving. First, we noticed the smell. It was pungent, like a skunk rotting on the side of the road. If I could use one word to describe the smell, it would be death. Unequivocal death. As the smell grew stronger, the sludge would move more and more with such fervor that we were sure the thing was going to burst. Except it didn't. One minute it was wriggling and squirming, and the next minute it went still. Tom and I waited for a moment, looked at each other with wide eyes, a silent, what the fuck passing between us. That's when we hear it, a loud popping noise like someone opening a champagne bottle. We look back quickly at the blob to see that it's no longer a mass of thick black sludge. In its place laid a boy, a human boy, pale and naked. He lay there shivering and whimpering like a puppy abandoned on the side of the road. Tom, in his deep, gruff voice, just sighed and said, Fuck this, bro. I'm out. He walked away, leaving me to investigate what in the actual world I was looking at. Should I have called the police? Should I have called Child Protective Services? Maybe, but you know what I did instead? I reached out my hand to touch the boy slowly. I needed to get him help somehow, but just when my fingertips almost grazed his shoulder, he shot up on all fours. He glared at me with frightened eyes, his mouth hanging open. I jumped back, bracing myself for a possible attack. The boy backed away, scooting on his hands and knees, growling at me like a dog that hadn't eaten in days. It's coming, he said in a throaty whisper as he continued to back away. I continued to watch in awe until he twisted his body in what seemed like the most painful way until he was standing upright. The boy gave me one last look in all of his nude glory and took off running toward the woods. I didn't know what he meant. I didn't know what was coming. But what I did know was that I needed to get out of there. I ran like my life depended on it and made my way back to the car in record time. I peeled out of that parking lot faster than Jeff Gordon during the Daytona 500, afraid to look back in my rearview mirror. I drove at least 20 miles over the speed limit all the way home. I double checked my locks once I was inside my house and stayed up all night, worried that something was coming for me. But it never did. To this day, I'm still not sure what the boy or sludge monster meant and I don't really want to find out. If you are interested in hearing more stories about my job as a garbage man, I have plenty more. My life may be a monotonous string of collecting trash, but at least I'm never bored. It all started with an inconveniently timed thunderstorm. It was Friday night, and my friends and I were hanging out by the old wooden footbridge that spanned across the lake. The bridge had gone into disrepair over the years, and since they built the new, sturdier concrete bridge closer to the lakeside playground, barely anyone used it anymore. It became a haven for us teenagers. We would gather and drink pilfered booze and smoke joints with barely a thought of getting caught. So there we were, passing around a bottle of spiced rum Jeff smuggled from his dad's liquor cabinet between the four of us, when the sky suddenly opened up and the rain poured down in sheets. We all scrambled underneath the bridge, ducking for cover and trying not to get dripped on through the cracks and missing boards. Well, this is just great, Cece grumbled, tucking herself under Randy's arm. I didn't know it was supposed to rain tonight, Randy said as he tried and failed to relight the soggy joint between his lips. I pulled out my phone and checked my weather app. 80% chance of rain from now until 5am. Looks like it's not going to stop anytime soon. I said, showing them my phone. What the hell are we all going to do now? Let's just jump in Jeff's car, have a party on wheels like old times, Randy suggested with a wink. No way, dude, Jeff told him, wiping a strand of soaking wet hair from his forehead. Last time we drank in my car, you spilled half the bottle and it reeked like vodka for a week. My dad almost beat my ass. Sad. Is there anywhere else we can go? Asked Cece, shivering. It's not even 8.30 yet. Way too early to pack it in for the night. What about your house, Jesse? Randy turned to and asked. Hey, my mom's cool and all, but you know she's not down for underage drinking. We can go there to chill if you want to ditch the bottle and the smoke. Randy snorted. Yeah, that's a no from me. I sighed. It used to be so easy to find something to do on the weekends. But ever since sophomore year when we added booze and pot to our extracurriculars, 
Finding somewhere to do those things were few and far between. Jeff turned to us, a smirk slowly spreading across his rain-soaked face. We could always hit up the creep house. Hilarious. I rolled my eyes at him, dismissing the idea entirely. Every small town has that one house that everyone talks about. You know the one. Maybe it's down the street, or maybe it's right next door. It's the house that every kid grows up hearing scary stories about. The one they all dare each other to walk up to the front steps of. The one that gives you the creeps just to look at. Maybe the legends say it's haunted, or someone was killed there. Maybe rumor has it a serial killer buried all his victims in the basement. Maybe it was used for satanic rituals. Whatever the story may be, the truth is usually something much less sinister. But sometimes, it's something much, much worse. 47 Rosewood Lane was ours. It was known around town as the Creep House, though no one really knew much about it or its history. There were just the rumors and stories. As long as I've been alive, no one had ever lived there, and my mother says it was vacant even when she was a child. It seemed like such a waste to me. The house was beautiful, maybe a little dated, but it was well built and hardly showed signs of wear after all these years of being an empty shell. It stood tall and proud on the corner of the street, two stories high, with white shingles adorning the outside of the second floor, while the entirety of the first floor was wrapped in the most beautiful cobblestones. The blue shutters hung off haphazardly in some places, the white shingles graying slightly with age, but for the most part, the house stood firm and unbroken. Despite its beauty, the house gave off a certain aura that gave everyone in town an aversion to it. People crossed the street instead of walking directly in front of it. Though there was room on the street in front of and on the side of the house to fit six cars or so, no one ever parked there. I've seen people drive around the block multiple times looking for a spot to park their car instead of taking a spot there. To my knowledge, no one had ever been as far as the front steps of the house. And I, for one, had never planned to get anywhere close. Even looking at the house for more than a few seconds gave me an uncomfortable feeling in my chest. Made my skin prickle. So the thought of actually going inside the mysterious structure sent my stomach doing flips. Oh, come on, Jesse. You're not seriously so afraid of that place. Jeff shot back at me, nudging my arm playfully with his elbow. No, Jeffrey, I'm not afraid of it. I know all those stories are visual. But God knows what could be lurking in there. I bet there's rats. I feel like I need a tetanus shot just walking by that place. I crossed my arms and shivered, not entirely from the rain. I'm with Jesse. Besides, that place gives me the heebie-jeebies, Cece said, backing me up. It's just a suggestion. Not like we have a lot of options right now. Jeff shrugged. At least it's somewhere dry, and we know nobody's going to come barging in there and bother us. It's not that bad, guys. I've been in there once, Randy said. I turned to look at him just as Cece and Jeff did the same. What? Randy just laughed. Last year, me and Greg Cummings snuck in there to smoke when his parents were home and we couldn't do it at his place. Cece shook her head at him. No way. I'm calling Pishol. Seriously, I'm not lying, Cece. It's closed up pretty good, so it's not as dirty as you'd think. Just old and dusty. It's the perfect spot. No one ever goes in there, so it's not like we get busted or anything. No one said anything for a long moment. Cece and I looked at each other, and I could see that she was feeling the same hesitations that I was. Think about it, guys. I mean, unless you just want to go home. Randy smiled as he leaned over and kissed Cece. I don't know, I said, looking over at Jeff. He looked back at me, and that little smirk crawled across his face. Tell you what. How about we check it out, and if it seems super sketch, we'll get out of there. Sound good? Cece sighed. Okay. Jesse? Jeff pressed. Even as every cell in my body was screaming at me to say no, I felt the peer pressure soften my resolve. Okay, yeah, I guess so. When there was a short break in the rain, we sprinted out from under the bridge and up the small hill to where Jeff had parked his car. As we drove the short ride over to Rosewood Lane, I couldn't shake the uneasy feeling that had settled in my chest at the idea of going into that house, but I didn't want to seem like a baby, so I kept it to myself. As Jeff pulled over to the side of the street and parked a few houses down from 47, a chill ran down my spine. Are you sure about this? I asked Jeff hesitantly. Come on, Jess. What's the worst that could happen? You know I'd never let anything happen to you. Then he flashed me that million-watt smile of his, 
and just like that, I relaxed into the idea. That was the thing about Jeff and me. He could talk me into just about anything. When he told me something was okay, I always trusted him. It had been that way forever. Jeff and I had been best friends for as long as I could remember. We lived just three houses down from each other, and he was the only other kid my age on our street, so it was only natural that we gravitated towards each other. Even as we got older, into middle school and high school, and we made other friends, we still stayed really close. Jeff was handsome, sweet, and charming, though he became very popular with ease. I was shy, reserved, a little awkward even, but because of Jeff, I was accepted amongst the popular crowd. Like I said, he was always taking care of me. That's how I found myself sneaking through the wrought iron gate and stepping up the stairs onto the back porch of 47 Rosewood Lane. I hugged my sweater close to me as a chill ran down my spine, despite the warmth of that spring night. Randy slid open the window to the right of the door, and I scanned the backyard as we waited for him to open the door for us. The shadows seemed deeper amongst the untamed landscape, darker, wilder somehow, though we were in the middle of suburbia. My stomach did flips as my eyes played tricks on me, finding sinister shapes in the darkness, leaves moving from the pounding raindrops taking on an eerie quality I couldn't explain. When Randy finally let us into the house, I felt like I was going to be sick. You okay? Jeff turned to me, concern lacing his eyebrows together as he stared into my face. I nodded and tried to smile. Yeah, I'm fine. I lied. He handed me one of the lanterns he brought with him, the one he always kept in the car for those dark nights down at the bridge, and I followed him into the pitch blackness of the house. We entered into a very basic looking kitchen, a little dusty and dated, but otherwise no worse for wear. It looked a bit old but in good condition, as if the stove and refrigerator were taken out of their boxes, installed, and simply left here never to be touched. Randy led the way down a wide hallway to what looked to be the main living area. It was very much the same as the kitchen, fully furnished and unused. An ornate looking floral sofa at perpendicular with a matching love seat, armchair, and a wooden coffee table, all coated in a thick layer of dust. Despite all the furnishings, I noticed that there were no other objects of decor. The white walls were bare of any pictures or photographs, the mantle completely empty of knickknacks. Something about that fact left me feeling unsettled, though I wasn't sure why. This place is sick, Cece exclaimed as she walked around the room. We should have been partying here since freshman year. We ready to get this party started again? Randy asked with his goofy grin, holding a fresh joint in one hand and the half-empty bottle of rum in the other. After dusting off the furniture and putting some music on Cece's phone, we spent the next couple of hours drinking, smoking, and laughing by lantern light. We were having such a good time that I could almost forget where we were. Almost. After a while, Jeff got the grand idea that we should go explore the rest of the house. It was around then that I heard a nagging voice in the back of my mind, telling me to get out and stay away from this place. Hey, you know, maybe we just head out? I mean, it's already 11. I'm getting kind of tired. Cece threw her arm around my neck. Aw, oh, come on, Jessica. The night is young. Besides, we're already here. We might as well take a look around and see what this place is all about. Yeah, Randy said. We'll just do a quick peek upstairs and then we'll get going. I looked pointedly at Jeff, waiting for him to chime in. Fifteen minutes tops, then I'll get you home. Deal? Fifteen minutes, I said firmly. He smiled and grabbed my hand, pulling me with him as he made his way towards the staircase. The upstairs was much the same as downstairs. Two small bedrooms and a master suite all fully furnished and unadorned. There was nothing very exciting about it, and I found myself becoming impatient as my friends poked around each mundane room. There was nothing very exciting about it, and I found myself becoming impatient as my friends poked around each mundane room. There was something nagging at me, some invisible nuisance telling me to get out of that house, that we had overstayed what had not been a welcome in the first place. After they had explored the tiny half-bathroom, I finally rallied up the drunken troops and we headed down the stairs toward the door. We stepped into the kitchen and I practically ran the last few feet to the back door. I placed my hand on the doorknob when Randy exclaimed from behind me, What the hell? I turned to my left to see him staring dumbfounded at a large ornate door that seemed out of place in this house. I didn't see that when we came in, Jeff said, but it came out as more of a question. I didn't recall seeing it when we entered either 
though a door like this would be impossible to miss. Jeff lifted the lantern up to illuminate the door. It was made of dark solid wood with wrought iron hinges and an elaborate wrought iron doorknob. Intricately carved designs looped in circles and curves around the thick wood. It reminded me of something medieval. Much like the rest of the house, the door was beautiful but made me feel increasingly uneasy. I felt a shiver run down my spine as Jeff reached out for the doorknob. Jeff, don't, I pleaded. He looked back at me with a reassuring smile and a shrug. Come on, Jess. It's not like we are going to find the boogeyman in there. Then he turned around and pulled open the door. We all gathered around Jeff at the mouth of the doorway. A staircase disappeared down into a darkness that was different than the rest of the house. It was more than just dark. It was a void. A complete absence of anything. There seemed to be a source of light at the bottom of the staircase. An unnatural red glow emanating from somewhere just far enough away from the bottom of the steps that we couldn't make out where it was coming from. Randy whipped his head around with a grin on his face, looking at each of us. We have to go check this fish out. A sinking feeling hit me in the gut as soon as we started descending those stairs. It was like when you eat something bad and it hits your stomach in just the wrong way to make it lurch instantaneously. I swallowed down the bile that started to rise into the back of my throat and held onto the rail with shaking fingers as, against every instinct in my body, I stepped down the few remaining stairs and onto the concrete floor of the basement. The first thing, really the only thing, to notice when we stepped into the large room was a giant gaping hole in the center. The hole seemed to be the source of the strange light we had glimpsed from above. A deep glowing red radiated up from its depths, like the last burning embers of a fire that was just on the cusp of being extinguished. What the hell is that? I asked, barely a whisper of wonderment and fear. That's pretty cool, Cece said with excitement. Maybe it's an old fire. I watched this documentary once about this town where a hole opened up in the ground like this. It turned out to be a fire in an underground mine that they thought they put out, but really it just kept burning, fueled by all the coal that was down there. They didn't even know about it until a sinkhole opened up and nearly killed a kid. It's actually still burning. They had to evacuate the town and everything. They said it could take hundreds of years for it to go out. Yeah, but there aren't any mines around here, Cece, Randy told her. It looks pretty deep, she said, leaning over slightly to look into the hole. I can't even see the bottom from here. Randy uncapped the bottle in his hand, poured the measly remains of it down his throat, and stepped closer to the edge. Let's throw this down there and see how long it takes to hit the bottom, he said, shaking the bottle in his hand. Guys, I don't think that's such a good idea. Maybe we should just... Ignoring my protests, Cece took the bottle from Randy and threw it in. We all waited a long few seconds and heard nothing. Huh, do you think it's still falling? She asked. I shrugged. I didn't hear it hit anything. Could be. That would mean it's really deep. Cece leaned further over the side to get a better look into the hole. Suddenly, two thick black tendrils shot up over the side of the hole and slapped down a foot in front of her with a loud, wet thump. She jumped backwards. What, what the actual f are those things? They almost looked like tree roots, but wrong somehow. They were pulsating, covered in a viscous black substance that resembled tar, with thousands of sharp spines running along the length, which tapered down to a razor-sharp looking point. As they slithered across the ground towards Cece, the sides of the hole began to pulse, changing from red to orange to yellow and back again. Cece crouched down and reached her hand towards one of them. Don't touch it, I yelped. She looked up at me. Oh, don't be such a baby, Jess. She touched it briefly and pulled her hand away to look at it, spreading her fingers as the black goop wedged in between. Gross. This stuff feels like melted silly putty. She put her hand down toward it to touch it again, and as soon as she made contact this time, she screamed and ripped her hand away. Ouch! She brought her fingers up and I could see the black spike sticking out of her pointer finger at an angle. Randy held her hand and grabbed the spike with two fingers, yanking it out as she whimpered in pain. As he pulled it out, something we thought would be mere centimeters long came out covered in her blood and was almost six inches long, stiff like a porcupine's quill. Cece's eyes bulged in horror as Randy held it up for her to see. It all happened so fast then. While we were all staring in amazement at the thing that had just been pulled from our friend's flesh, the second root crept slowly closer to Cece. 
Then, without warning, it reared up and wrapped itself tightly around her leg, jerking her backwards. She lost her balance and fell down face first onto the floor. The other one wrapped around her other leg and she was pulled, screaming and clawing toward the hole. Get it off me! She screamed. Help me! She caught the lip of the opening just as the thing pulled her over the edge of the pit. We all rushed to her. Randy and Jeff each grabbed one of her arms, pulling with all their strength to get her back up to safety as she screamed. She gripped their arms so hard, frantically clawing at their skin to gain her grip. I saw blood start to drip down each of their arms. Help me, please, oh God, let me go, let me go, let me go! I stared on in horror as my friend fought for her life, feeling useless and terrified and utterly rooted in place. Cece screamed on for what felt like hours but was in reality merely seconds as Jeff and Randy played tug of war with this monstrous black tentacle from the depths of hell. Slowly, I was aware of Cece's voice beginning to change. Let me go. She continued to yell, over and over again, but her voice changed from panicked and desperate to an almost dreamy, wistful shout. As I watched Cece let her grip fall from the boy's arms, I realized she was no longer yelling at the thing that had captured her. She was now telling Jeff and Randy to let her go. She pushed herself away and slipped from their grasps, falling backwards into the pit. And I swear, in that last moment, I saw her smile. Not wanting to waste even a moment more, I grabbed Randy and Jeff by their shirts and hauled them up off the ground. We need to get the f*** out of here, right now, I yelled. Randy stared numbly down the pit for a moment, then turned on his heel and raced up the stairs. I grabbed Jeff's hand and made for the steps, practically dragging him behind me. We were just two steps away from the door when I felt Jeff pull on my hand before his slipped out of mine. I turned just in time to see one of the tendrils had followed us up the steps and wrapped itself around his leg. He writhed and screamed, trying to fight it off, but the harder he tried, the tighter it seemed to wrap around him, like a boa constricting its prey. I could see the many spines boring deep, deep, deeper into his skin. He looked up at me in agony. Jesse, run. Without thinking, I raced back down the stairs and grabbed both of his hands in mine. As I started to pull him, his cries became even more pained. Randy! I yelled up the stairs. Help! I knew that it was a long shot. He was so far ahead of us, he was probably down on Main Street by now. It was just me and Jeff and this thing slowly curling its way further up his body, and it was up to me to find a way to stop it. Letting go of his hands, I wrapped my hands around the writhing black root that had taken hold of his thigh and pulled with all of my strength. I felt the small spikes stab into the soft meat of my palms and still I pulled. It was then that I remembered the knife Jeff always carried in his pocket. Holding the root with one hand, I used the other to dig into the pockets of his jeans until my hand closed around the lump of metal. I pulled it out and in one swift motion, I opened the blade and severed the tendril just below Jeff's sneaker. More of that black tar came shooting out of the severed end, and the piece that was wrapped around Jeff's leg recoiled almost immediately and retracted quickly back toward the hole in the ground. Come on, I yelled, wasting no time. I grabbed Jeff up off the floor and pulled him along on an injured leg toward the stairs. Before we could even make the first step, the other tendril shot out and wrapped around his torso. Jeff let out an agonized scream. Blood immediately pooled across his light blue shirt in too many places for me to count as the spikes dug into his flesh. The other root, the one I had severed, shot forward from the pit and poking out of his socket where his right eye had been. I yelled his name as he was ever so slowly lifted up off the ground. Jess, go, he cried, black mixed with blood oozing down his face. Run. I shook my head. No, no, I can't leave you, Jeff. I... I love you, Jesse. He sputtered thickly, coughing up the thick substance. Then his expression began to change. His lips pulled into a serene smile, and he looked into my eyes one last time. It feels... better now, he said dreamily. I looked on in horror as he was slowly pulled backward into the pit. The edges of the hole glowed bright red, and the earth seemed to contract around it as the hole grew a little smaller. I swear for a moment I heard Jeff laugh as he disappeared into the abyss, and then he was gone. Everything was still, quiet. I fell to the floor, unable to scream, unable to cry. I just sat there and stared at that pit 
that just swallowed up my best friend. I never got to tell him that I loved him too, that I had been in love with him for as long as I could remember. It wasn't until I saw that thick black rope inch its way back out of the depths that I found my feet and ran up those stairs, taking them two at a time like the devil was on my heels. I ran down the hallway and out the door. I barely registered the rain beating down on my skin as my sneakers hit the pavement and I kept on running. I ran without seeing what was in front of me. I ran with Jeff's final moments dancing in front of my eyes. I ran until I reached the door of my house. I slammed the door shut, locked the deadbolt, the handle, the chain. And then I collapsed into a heap, a mass of drenched clothes and wet hair, covered in blood and black and dirt. And finally, I cried. My mother hurried to the front door and found me there, curled up in a ball. She sat down beside me and wordlessly pulled me into her arms. She smoothed back my sopping hair as she hugged me and rocked us back and forth. After a while, I calmed down enough to tell her what had happened. She sat and listened to me as I recalled every detail from that night. Every single thing that happened from the first moment we decided to check out the old cursed house to the minute I ran through our front door. She looked at me first with concern, then with sympathy. By the end of my story, her face was laced with utter confusion. Honey, they knocked that old house down years ago. There's nothing but a vacant lot there now. No, Mom, what are you talking about? The Morris house? That thing was a hazard after someone set fire to it. The thing had been abandoned since I was a girl anyways. Whoever lit it up did us all a favor as far as I'm concerned. The house was nothing but a haven for drug addicts and delinquents. Good riddance. I shook my head, eyebrows furrowing in confusion. Morris House? No, 47 Rosewood Lane. No one has ever lived there. It's still there. We were just in there. I told you. Me, Jeff, Cece, and Randy Lundstrom. Her eyebrows rose in surprise. Randy Lundstrom? What on earth were you doing hanging out with that boy? He's always causing trouble. Cece and him have been together since 8th grade, Mom. He's one of Jeff's best friends. He's been over here a million times. I exclaimed, exasperated. She looked at me like what I was saying made no sense to her. Who are Jeff and Cece? After that, I told my mom I had a headache and I needed to go lay down. What the hell was happening? My mom had known Jeff since he was... My mom had known Jeff since he was born. She knew Cece since we started preschool together. When I got up to my room, I pulled out my cell phone and called Randy. Um, I'm fine. Who is this? He asked after he answered and I asked if he was okay. It's Jesse. There was a silence from the end of his phone. Jessica Wellen. Oh? He replied, sounding even more confused than before. What's, uh, what's up? Randy, where the fuck did you go? It got Jeff too. I tried to save him, but I... I let out a shaky breath on the verge of tears again. And now my mom is acting like she doesn't know who Jeff or Cece are. I don't know what's going on, but I feel like I'm losing my mind here. I ran my hand through my hair, gripping the phone tightly to my ear. There was a long pause before I heard Randy let out a breath and chuckle uncomfortably. Look, I, uh, I gotta be honest here. I have no clue what you are talking about. Is this like a joke or some fish? Because I'm really confused, dude. I hung up the phone and sunk down to my bedroom floor, paralyzed. I didn't know what the hell was going on, but I felt like I was going crazy. How was it possible that no one remembered them? that no one remembered anything about two people who had been a part of my life forever. It had to have something to do with that house. I wish I never set foot in there. I should have just went home. I should have suggested that we went anywhere else. Now, I'll have to live with this pain for the rest of my life, mourning the loss of a wonderful friend in CC, and mourning the loss of a love that never got to see the light of day. Jeff had been with me through everything. Every single memory in my 17 years of life was touched by him. Jeff holding my hand as we walked into our first day of preschool together. Jeff carrying me home as I cried in his arms after I rode my bike without training wheels for the first time and fell off. Jeff breaking up with Jenna Branson, the most popular girl in our 6th grade class, because she made fun of my haircut and made me cry. Jeff holding me as I cried when I caught Ronnie Hopkins cheating on me at a party in sophomore year. That one I'll never forget. We walked down to the Longfellow Park afterward and skipped rocks across the pond while sharing a bottle of cheap vodka. The night started with a mess of tears and ended with both of us crying from laughing so hard. Jeff always took care of me, 
that is how it has always been, and the one time he needed me, really needed me to help him, I failed. I would have to live the rest of my life with a gnawing, crushing feeling of guilt inside of me, and I would have to do it alone. Something is wrong with that house. Something evil and sinister lives in the bowels of 47 Rosewood Lane, or at least it used to. You see, I walked over there this morning, hoping that investigating the house in the light of day would give me some clarity on what the hell happened last night. But when I got down to the corner, to the place the house had always stood, tall and foreboding, all I found was a vacant lot. When I was a sophomore in high school, my best friend's mother, we will refer to her as Jane, passed away in a really bizarre accident. I remember when we received the news like it happened an hour ago. It was especially memorable because it happened to be the first time ever that my friend, we will call him Joan, ever decided to skip class with me. Jones and I weren't really troublemakers. If anything, we were both considered the nerdy kids, even though Jones was kind of dumb and I only really looked like a nerd. Didn't even play video games back in those days, unless it was multiplayer. But you get the idea. We were nerds. A couple of goody two-shoes. We went to this red brick school in the south, keeping it vague. That was kind of run down and relatively small. Every day, halfway through the day, we had a block class where we sat and worked on homework from other classes or asked the teacher for help with things we generally didn't understand. Sometimes we watched the news, but that was pretty rare. Every other Friday, usually. Jones and I had planned to sneak away during block class one Friday while our teacher decided to play the news for us. We were pretty determined, so it was relatively easy. I asked to use the restroom, and Jones told me later when we met up that he snuck out after the lights were off. The goal of the day? To try and explore any potentially creepy areas the school might be hiding behind closed doors. I had a hall pass, so I was good. I played lookout, peeking around the corners to make sure that Jones wouldn't get caught if the hall monitor was out there. Eventually, we made our way downstairs and into the basement. We knew it would be unlocked, because two weeks prior, another kid got detention for breaking the lock to see what was down there and bragged about it. Though apparently, the lock had been fixed. Jones was really nervous about breaking it with me, but I convinced him to do it anyway. What's the worst that could happen? Some schools were getting cameras installed around this time, but ours wasn't one of them. The budget for our school was pretty sad. Nobody was around, and if we were caught downstairs, maybe we could get away with lying, telling them we found the lock that way. Of course, I realized that never would have worked now, but I was a young, dumb kid. Anyway, Jones and I made our way down there, and it was sufficiently creepy. What was really odd, though, was that the light switch didn't work. Luckily, my digital watch had a little button you could press, and the face would light up green. So we continued hardly able to see. It was starting to get a little hot down there, and Jones started to complain, saying that the heat was making him itch. I told him to stop being a crybaby, and he went completely silent. I continued on, not realizing that he had stopped following me for at least a good 60 seconds. I called for him, but he didn't answer. I was getting creeped out now, but brushed it off as him probably pouting. Whatever, I told him. Be that way, crybaby. My voice was a little shaky when I said it, but I was determined not to look scared, so I went on without him until I found a door. Next to the door, there was a stack of blank copy paper. I don't know why I remember that so vividly, but it drew my attention somehow. Maybe I thought I saw something else? I opened the door, which was pretty warm, and discovered the boiler room. It was oddly warm in there, since the boiler was no longer being used at this time. Our school had just made the switch to a furnace. Besides the boiler, there wasn't much to look at, but my kid brain still enjoyed how creepy it was. Just some old tools and a rusty cabinet and a small sink, a couple of stools and folded chairs, a spray bottle. There was a lot of dust and spiderwebs which made it even more interesting for my kid brain. And then I heard crying. Was it Jones? I called out his name, but he didn't answer. Then I heard a crash that scared me out of my wits. I swear I piddled a little and slammed my hip into the cabinet then quickly dashed underneath it to hide. If it was a teacher, I really didn't want detention because my dad would beat my ass. And if it wasn't a teacher, well, that might be worse. I hid for a few minutes, 
the sobbing sound eventually returned while I was under there. Someone had to be down there with me. If it was Jones, why wasn't he answering? He couldn't have been that mad at me. We were always calling each other names. I was down there for what felt like forever. Jones never came back, but the crying never stopped. Finally, I got up to leave. Just as I was about to shut the door to the boiler room, I heard a female voice that sent shivers down my spine and a horrible icy feeling in my gut. What are you doing down here, young man? came the hiss of a woman who sounded uncannily like Jane, Jones's mother. At the time, though, I thought maybe it could be a teacher, so I dashed out of there as fast as I could, hoping to avoid my face being seen. I tripped and scraped my knee, hit the light on my watch as fast as I could, and went to rush out of the basement before tripping right over Jones, who cried out in fear and pain, which scared me again. Once I calmed down, I realized that Jones was crying. He blamed it on my tripping over him, but his face was kinda red, and looking back on it, I think he had been crying before that. Was he the crying voice I'd been hearing? He must have been. And the female voice? Definitely had to have been a teacher. We only had one janitor and he was a male. Mystery solved. I felt much better. All the creepiness was in my head. Or so I thought. Joan said he was done, that he just wanted to go back to class. Just as we agreed, the bell for next period sounded, causing us both to jump. Clearly, he was as jumpy as I was. But I still had a hall pass I needed to return, and even though he was probably going to get in trouble, he agreed to walk back with me, as we were both shaken up, I assume. So, we get back to the block class, and Mrs. Bell is standing there waiting for us, but she doesn't look angry, just very concerned, and her eyes are fixed on Jones, who is looking increasingly nervous by the second. We exchange a look before approaching her, and she approaches us as well, dropping to her knees and dramatically taking Jones's hands in hers. I remember her exact words. Honey, she said to Jones, I'm afraid I have to send you home for the day. Your father is waiting in the principal's office to come and collect you. He told him, giving his hands a squeeze before standing back up. You need to talk. I'm always here, sweetheart, she told Jones, who gave me another nervous look before taking off. I handed Mrs. Bell the hall pass, and she took it without a word. Collecting my books, I moved on to the next class, feeling somewhat ill for the rest of the school day, which I brushed off as anxiety, wondering what Jones and Mrs. Bell's exchange could have been about. As soon as I got home that day, I called Jones on his family landline. His father answered, telling me that Jones wouldn't be in school for a couple of weeks. His mother had passed that day, around the same time we were skipping class, apparently. He didn't tell me much other than that she had died the day before, and it was understandably off the phone pretty quick. A few weeks passed, and Jones was back in class. He found me first thing when he was back and told me what happened. Apparently, Jane had gone on a long drive following an argument she had had with Jones's father, saying she was going to go out to buy some cigarettes. When she returned, Jane was crying inconsolably, and somehow managed to damage the locking mechanism in the car. It was a really, really hot summer day, one of the hottest on record back then, so, with all of her inconsolable crying and heavy breathing, and the sun beating through the windows, he had died of a heat stroke. After telling me this, he hardly spoke to me from then on. He was like a changed person. He began dressing in black and hanging out with the goth kids. We still talked occasionally, but drifted apart a bit over the high school years. I always wondered why the hell his father had thought it was a good idea to tell him what happened. I always thought the story was pretty weird, but never pried. Like, why didn't his father break the window or something? It just sounded so... odd. Did her car not have any working AC? Fast forward to grad night. Jones and I hook up momentarily, wanting to stay in contact despite drifting apart. So we exchanged information and went our separate ways. I never forgot about this weird situation though. Fast forward even further. I'm 30 years old now. This is what made me want to post about it. I haven't spoken to Jones in a year or two, but we've kept contact and I still have his information. I have a boyfriend, yes I'm gay, and he and I got into a serious verbal fight one morning before I left for work. I'm embarrassed to admit that it left me in tears, and I decided to call in sick for the day and take a detour instead to sort out my thoughts. I went to buy myself a pack of Marlboro Reds, they've always been my favorite. Had myself a smoke, then drove to the park. It was a weekday, and our town is relatively small, so I happened to be alone at the park that day. 
It was raining pretty hard, but as I smoked my cigarette, my window was cracked. I started to feel really hot. Was I getting sick or something? I tried to open the car door to get out and breathe, but the door wasn't opening for some reason. It couldn't have been the locks, because they were working just fine, but I could not get that door open. Even though the window was cracked, I kinda started to panic a little and called my boyfriend on my cell. I told him what was going on, and he told me he was getting in an Uber to come over to me and break me out. I started looking through the glove box, not really certain what I expected to find, but was hoping to find something to smash the windows with. I wasn't even thinking at the time about how oddly parallel this story seemed to be running to James. Someone tapped on the window, scaring the shit out of me. When I looked, I did a double take. It was Jane, and she looked completely fine, albeit a little older. What the fuck? My jaw literally dropped and she laughed at me, motioning to roll down the window all the way. So I did. Weird, because the window hadn't worked just moments before. I waited for her to speak. Boy, I'm surprised to see you here. What are you doing all the way out in this neck of the woods? She asked, as though nothing were out of place but me. I didn't even know what to say. I kind of just stuttered gibberish until she spoke again. She said my name. It's been nice catching up, Shane, he told me, then walked away as though nothing had happened. When my boyfriend showed up, he just pulled on the handle and it opened, and he thought I was losing it because of that, which discouraged me from telling him what happened. I did not imagine that. I wasn't drunk. I wasn't drugged. She was there. Definitely. First, I googled her. Nothing beyond her obituary. Then, after a long debate with myself, I called my friend and was met with a slew of curses and views in response to the story. Jones didn't believe me at all. He called me an old sack and told me he would change his number. No calls back. I didn't call him back because I felt really bad. What the fuck did I just experience? I only have two theories of my own. The first is that maybe Jane was trying to disappear for some reason, and her husband helped her to do it. And the other theory is paranormal. I'm kind of leaning towards it the first, as I've never believed in the paranormal. But even with the first theory, there are still things I don't feel are explainable by that.